thank you, Stuart. Uh, and thanks also to everybody else involved in uh, bringing me down here. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, what I am going to talk about is myself. Um, uh, but I just want to say that Atlanta has always been at the top of my list of uh, American cities I've never been to before. Uh, I was telling Stuart before the talk that my goal before I pass away is to, to visit every great American city. And um, my flight this morning was delayed five hours. So I've only been in Atlanta for about 120 minutes. So I don't have any opinions about it yet. Um, but whilst I was at the airport, I don't know if you want any book recommendations. Uh, I read half of uh, Niall Rogers' autobiography, Le Freak. He was uh, the guitarist in Chic. And uh, it's truly an extraordinary book. Uh, I'm very interested in disco music, and I spend all my money on rare disco records. But I'd recently read Patti Smith's autobiography, and uh, Keith Richards, and uh, Bob Dylan's, and Sean Ryder's from The Happy Mondays, and they're all great books. Uh, but this is a better book than all of them put together. So Niall Rogers, Le Freak, I highly recommend it. Um, OK, um, what I am going to talk about really is uh, how I got involved in art, I guess. And uh, hopefully along the way, uh, why I remain interested in it and uh, you know how I came to do several things simultaneously and why I find that interesting and uh, my approach to doing that. And also my commitment, I think, largely to working within a not-for-profit context. Um, but that will come up later. Um, are the images OK with the lights on? I don't know if it's too bright in the room. Can we turn the lights down a little bit, house lights, if that's possible? I don't know if it's possible. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Uh, so Stuart mentioned uh, I, I, I'm just turned 47, and I'm British. And I think ultimately both of those things are quite important. And they do have some bearing on uh, me and uh, my approach to things and uh, how I think about things. But my talk begins uh, in uh, the north of England. I grew up in a very kind of conventional working class town. And I come from a very kind of conventional working class background. Uh, certainly art uh, didn't play any role whatsoever in my family's life or my extended family's life. And uh, in the 1978 and 1979, so when I was 13 and 14 years old, um, I started to write a music fanzine. And I'd been very interested. Uh, I was too young, I think, to, to really fully comprehend uh, what punk rock meant in 1976 and 1977. I would have been 11 into 12. I was certainly aware of it. It was a very uh, present idea in the UK. Um, but certainly, I don't think I, I didn't have enough uh, information or experience in life to really process what it meant. But certainly by the time I was 13 and 14 in 78 and 79, I think the, the, the sense of permission uh, that punk rock opened up uh, became very kind of tangible to me as a young person. And uh, I became very interested in the independent music scene that emerged immediately out of the sort of post-77 uh, moment, a time when Lots of people started their own record labels. A lot of people started publishing their own fanzines. And uh, as a young person, uh, I think I didn't really know what to do with uh, my interest. Uh, I was you know, a fan on the one hand. Uh, but even at that stage, even though I don't think I was necessarily conscious of it, there was a desire to do something else. And uh, subsequently, I've, I've talked about this, this idea uh, uh, as a, a sort of between the audience and the stage. And, uh, I think even as a very young person, I knew I had no desire to be a performer, so I had no desire to be in a band. Uh, I had no desire to be on stage. Uh, but at the same time, there was a sense of frustration, and I think it was a very palpable sense of frustration of just being in the audience, which it's a generalization, but I think you know, it was a largely passive, passive role. Um, and I think as a young person, I was trying to find, find a space for myself and my nascent ideas, and obviously my naive ideas, as to how to rationalize uh, the discrepancy between what was unfolding in front of me and uh, my engagement and interest in it. So I started to write a music fanzine. And um, I think the music fanzine uh, you know, wasn't a particularly novel or a brilliant idea. Uh, but it did do something very sub substantial for me as a young person. That it allowed me to have conversations with people. So instead of simply being a fan of something, 
I could approach people, the musicians I was interested in, and have a conversation with them based on the idea that the fanzine was the, the forum for this uh, connection. And at the time, I was a cripplingly shy young person. So the fanzine also allowed me to talk to people in a way that there was a, there was a kind of threshold. And um, I think what happened quite quickly um, was this is obviously pre-internet and pre-social networking and pre-Twitter and pre-Facebook, is that through this kind of very sort of modest endeavor uh, and through a very kind of organic process of the, the fanzine finding its way into the world, I started to, as a 13 and 14 year old, started to get in touch with other people who had shared interests. And I think for me living in this very kind of relatively isolated context in a small town, uh, all of a sudden the world got much larger. And uh, the most exciting part of my day was no longer you know, school or whatever one does after school. Uh, it was the arrival of the postman who brought information from all over the world. And I think for me as a, you know, as a teenager, uh, it sort of shaped pretty much every thought I've had since. Um, this is a photograph uh, taken in Manchester and uh, it's taken in the uh, summer of uh, 1970. Nine. And in the background is a 14 year old me. And it's the band Joy Division in their rehearsal studio. And uh, I used to watch Joy Division rehearse on Sunday afternoons. And um, it was bands like Joy Division and The Fall and Throbbing Gristle and Cabaret Voltaire, this first generation of now legendary British post punk bands that I was very interested in. And I think. Um, not only was I interested in their music, which sounded radical to me even as a young person, uh, but I was also interested in the fact that they had uh, other interests. And I think it's directly through my interest in the independent music scene at that time that I became interested in visual culture and I eventually became interested in art. So through references, bands would make in interviews or on their record sleeves or allusions in their lyrics and so on. Uh, they would mention things that I had no idea about. So the situation is international, Dada, et cetera. I mean, literally things I knew nothing about. And I would try and find out about them. And of course, trying to find out about things at the time was quite difficult. There wasn't a, a resource, there wasn't an internet. So each time I managed to find out a new piece of information, it felt like a really small but significant victory. And uh, it took a very, very long time to find out something. So it took me probably 10 years before I had a clearer understanding of what the situation is international was. So I spent a decade trying to piece together little pieces of information that I found from other sources. But I think what really um, impressed me about Joy Division was in the photograph, they're only in their early 20s. I think they're 21, 22 years old. The lead singer Ian Curtis killed himself about a year after this photograph was taken. Uh, what really impressed me as a young person and impresses me to this day is uh, they had a very kind of clear sense of what they were trying to do and how they were going to do it. And as a band, they decided to share all of the royalties, the songwriting royalties between them, regardless of who wrote the songs, which is actually an incredibly radical idea. Uh, almost no bands do that. I can only think of U2 for sure that do it, and U2 modeled it on Joy Division. But the idea to eliminate ego within the structure of a band, every band splits up over arguments to do with ego and money. And before they even became successful, they'd figured out a solution to that. But also there was a kind of self-determination and, and a kind of sense of independence and uh, uh, a sense of uh, ambition around what they were trying to do that went far beyond the kind of typical idea of what a rock band might do or what purpose a rock band might serve. And you saw this later when they became New Order and they started a nightclub in Manchester that they basically paid for themselves in order to create a context in their city that they found interesting and so on. But certainly as a young person, it was incredibly impressive to be around them. Uh, they just uh, carried themselves in a really interesting way and it was certainly a way that I was completely uh, unfamiliar with at the time. Um, the first time I saw them play live, uh, I think towards the end of 1978 when I was 13, remains the greatest thing I've ever seen. And uh, I think in some respects, it was really great to get that out of the way age 13 so that obviously everything else since has been a disappointment. But in some regards, it was good just to get that out of the way so that you don't really go looking for those kind of moments ever again. Um, so this was me as a young person trying to sort of think about things. And um, 
And certainly my interest in art director, as I said, came out of this situation. And I think quite quickly, probably by 1981, my interest in music had uh, certainly diminished. And my interest in art had really taken over. So by the time I was 15 or 16, I think I was really sub substantially interested in contemporary art. And again, at that time, it wasn't really easy for me as a young person to find things out. Certainly the British art scene wasn't necessarily in great shape in the early 1980s, uh, but I didn't really know that. So every time I found out anything, it seemed amazingly interesting to me, uh, regardless of what it was. And eventually I decided to go to art school, and I went to art school to, as an undergraduate fine artist uh, in 1984, and I went to uh, a city in the north of England called uh, Newcastle. Uh, certainly at that time in my life, I didn't have any great interest in London, uh, I'd grown up in the north of England, near Liverpool and Manchester, where all these amazing bands were in Leeds and Sheffield, also in the north of England. And the idea of London and the Metropolitan Centre just seemed completely uninteresting to me. And I'd always been interested in how the musicians in Manchester, they really didn't think about London at all. They thought about everywhere else. They didn't really seem to have this deferential relationship to the, to the major city. Uh, that was always interesting to me too. Uh, so I went to study at a regional college. And um, I think... Uh, even by the time I got to college, I think I, I sort of knew that I wasn't necessarily interested in being an artist. Um, but I certainly felt that art school was the, probably the only place uh, that I could spend three years thinking about the things that I was interested in. I'd always been interested in the uh, relationship between art school and music in the UK, which is very well documented. Uh, but it was something that certainly interested me. That, uh, certainly at that time in the UK, art education was free. And uh, it really did feel like a, a place you could go and hang around for three years with some interesting people and see what happens. Uh, I think, you know, I was fortunate to have that kind of luxury. Um, but certainly making art wasn't necessarily something that I, I felt compelled to do, um, although it's something I, I still do to this day. Um, I left college in 87 and moved to London. And uh, I think at that time that just seemed inevitable. I didn't give it too much thought, but it just turned out to be an extremely interesting time to move to London. and. Uh, there was several generations of younger artists in London uh, starting to create context for themselves. So on the one hand, very famously, Damien Hurst and his colleagues from Goldsmiths College organized an exhibition called Freeze, I think in 1988, and began uh, what became the YBA, the Young British Artist thing. But there were other artists in other parts of the city that were doing really interesting things, and everybody was in their mid-20s or younger. And uh, it really felt like a generational shift. It felt like a, a desire to sort of uh, leave behind uh, some of the kind of staid British art world of the 1980s and uh, as a generation to try and find a, a new context. And uh, it interested me a great deal. Um, when I arrived in London in 87, I didn't really know what to do uh, uh, for a living. Uh, London, it's hard to believe, was actually a relatively affordable city to live in at the time. And uh, I decided very early not to work in the art world. So that was, that was the only idea I had was not to work in the art world. And I, to pay my rent, I just got a regular job. Um, and what I was interested to do was to sort of just see what was happening and to think about what was happening and think about my relationship to it and to start to think about how I might productively engage with it without any plans. Uh, certainly at that time, I didn't think of myself as a curator. I didn't think of myself as a writer. Uh, I wasn't really thinking about myself as an artist necessarily. Uh, but I was definitely interested in these things that were unfolding before me. So over a five-year period, I think, between, say, 87 and 92, I probably saw everything that happened in London during that period. Uh, I mean, everything. I mean, I made a point of seeing everything. It felt to me that it was very hard for me to have an opinion or even to think about how I might engage with this if I didn't understand what was going on. So it seemed critical to me to understand what was unfolding. Uh, so it was a very interesting time just to see an awful lot of interesting stuff and a lot of very important and historical things happen during that period. During this time, I was still trying to make work. And uh, I don't want to be self-deprecating too much about my art, although I will be a little bit. But it sort of uh, keeps me entertained in a way that nothing else does. And I think it's one of the sort of persistently interesting things I find about maintaining my practice as an artist. But at the time, this is what I was making. Uh, these were just book pages, so it's obviously much larger. And I was reading a lot of American detective fiction at the time, uh, mostly from the 50s and early 60s. And I noticed after I'd read maybe like a couple of hundred American detective novels that 
in 5% of them, artists appeared as characters within the narrative. And I thought this was pretty interesting because, you know, it seemed to me that the guys that wrote these novels, and they were always men, uh, were very sophisticated. They were picking up on stuff that was going on in the culture and then repackaging it within popular form of mystery novels. And I think it must have been tied in somehow to those famous uh, photos of Jackson Pollock that appeared in Life, Time Life, Life magazine, where all of a sudden there was a sort of an idea of the artist in the public consciousness, and the artist was a crazy wild man in the woods. And often in these detective novels, the Artists appeared as kind of villains, murderers, rapists, you know, really truly awful people. And I thought it was interesting, these sort of caricatures of the artist as a kind of sort of a desperate, broken male. And it seemed to me it was very close to the kind of people I'd been taught by at college in the 80s, <laughs> uh, where the sort of bitterness, the decades of bitterness, was actually the teaching method. And it was sort of uh, the worst thing that could happen was for the students to be successful. Um, I was mentioning it before, but when I went to college, it was very alcoholic. I remember the staff would go to the pub at about noon, and they'd come back about four o'clock, I think. And that, was the, that was the teaching day. Um, but what I was finding in these book pages was just single sentences that somehow addressed the idea of uh, success. And of course, at this time in London, late 80s, very early 90s, the idea of success for a young artist all of a sudden became a very kind of tangible proposition. And uh, you'd end up with sentences like, um, so why wasn't I the one artist in a thousand who could earn his living by painting? Or even better, without art as a commercial outlet, I turned to drinking as a substitute, and I've been drinking ever since. <laughs> and obviously, these seem like antiquated anachronistic ideas of the artist. You know, you might think about, you know, Van Gogh going mad or Pollock in the woods, but, or, you know, Pollock pissing into Peggy Guggenheim's fireplace and so forth, but they seem to me persistent ideas, and obviously in the 1950s and 60s, these were sort of um, ideas that detective novels were picking up on the time. Um, for a living, I, I worked in an advertising agency, and I had a very humdrum uh, administration job. Uh, it really was an extremely boring job, and I liked it because it was an extremely boring job. There were no prospects, uh, and I had an extremely nice boss. I mean, truly, truly great guy who I'm still friends with to this day. And um, eventually, he figured out, and I figured out that I didn't really have enough work uh, to keep me at the office uh, nine to five. And he said to me one day, he said, "Oh, you just come and go as you please, as long as you get the work done." And I said, "That's said, great. That's that's great." So eventually I was almost not going to work at all. I was going to work for 20 minutes one day, not the next day. I'd go for a couple of hours. I'd go on Friday afternoons because they had cocktails on Friday afternoons. They're very Mad Men-ish. Um, but basically I wasn't at work. And uh, it was perfect for me because it allowed me to do all the things I was interested in, which was go and see stuff in London. Uh, but one of my jobs at work was uh, we got all of the local newspapers from across the United Kingdom. Uh, so once you've got away from the bigger cities and you're in smaller cities and regional communities, and because their clients might have had advertising in them for one reason or another. And I started to read the newspapers at work just to see what was going on outside of London and started to notice small stories about art. And uh, I became very interested in how art was reported away from the metropolitan centers. And I started to collect these stories, and most of them are extraordinarily banal. Um, but you end up with some where you have this amazing headline, Art Exhibition Attracts Visitors, as if it's news. And I thought it was a really powerful indictment of something. And uh, you know, I've always questioned the, the value of art or the purpose of art because uh, no one's ever explained that adequately to me. I'm convinced of its value and its purpose. Uh, but I don't really have a strong enough uh, conviction or a convincing answer for that. Uh, certainly when I was growing up, it didn't seem to have a purpose. Or a, uh, So I thought in some of those things were addressed in these. And this was published in a, uh, an artist published magazine at some point in the early 90s. But after spending five years just looking at stuff, um, this is what I came up with. And uh, it was a publishing project uh, that was called Imprint 93. And between 93 and I think 97 or 98, I can't remember when it finished, uh, I think I published 60 different projects with artists. And uh, 
Clearly, it was very informed by my teenage experience publishing fanzines, but it was also informed by historical things I'd become interested in, like Mela, Fluxus Publications, uh, some of the most kind of Samizdat distribution structures of other kinds of sort of circulation systems and so forth. But what it was for me was really an attempt to start working with artists. And uh, I didn't have any money, I didn't have a space, I didn't have an audience. Uh, but I wanted to work with artists on projects. And I think this is the thing that interests me most and it's the thing that continues to motivate me. And also at this time in the early 90s, very few people were publishing independently in this way. So by default, it almost had the territory to itself. So I started to invite artists whose work I was seeing for the first time, mostly artists of my generation, although not exclusively, if they were interested in working on a project together. The project had to cost nothing or close to nothing and it would be distributed by mail. And they were sent to people that I and the artist I was working with felt were doing something interesting. And they were sent unsolicited, so they just appeared in the post. And for me, it was, a, it was sort of thinking about sort of, uh, you know, forms of exchange, potlatch culture, but also just the idea of a sort of a reciprocal gesture. So I'd always been interested as a young person that people organized clubs, that people organized gigs, people started record labels so that I could enjoy them. Uh, and I was interested in the idea of sort of acknowledging people's uh, endeavors through a kind of gift, uh, albeit a gift they didn't know who was sending it. And eventually, I think, as the projects keep, come, kept coming, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, it started to build up a logic for itself. My name was never attached to it. Uh, so they were somewhat surreptitious, but as it grew, it became much more public. Uh, but it allowed me to test things out. It allowed me to think about the things that I was interested in. It allowed me to reflect uh, my quite broad interests in visual culture. And uh, it allowed me to sort of, um, you know, just, just think about what it is, what it means to actually work with artists, what it is to commission new work, and what it is to think about something in the present tense, but also think about it historically. Um, I'd always been in, interested in within avant-gardes in the 20th century, the, the idea of self asceticization which is such an important part of every avant-garde, they almost seem the most keenly aware of their future value, even when that value hasn't been uh, you know, confirmed. Uh, so this is just a sampling of some of the things I published at that time. Uh, I made them all at the advertising agency initially at night. Uh, I used to go in and use all of the photocopying machines, and uh, one of my jobs in my uh, less than interesting uh, job was to order supplies for our floor. So nobody ever noticed that I was running 30, 40, 50,000 photocopies. <laughs> and uh, I always paid for the postage myself. I thought that would be like criminal uh, if I put them into the office postal system. So somehow there were some morals or ethics at play. Um, but I worked with a lot of very interesting artists. And I think why this project sort of became interesting, I think is possibly remains interesting is really to do with the people I worked with. So I published the earliest publications uh, with Peter Doig, Chris Ophelia, Elizabeth Payton, Martin Creed, Jeremy Della, Seal Floyer, uh, Paul Noble, and many others. And uh, for me, it was just very interesting that you know, these were the, my peers, these were artists whose work I was seeing at that time, and uh, they were very accessible. And they were very interested to make work outside of the context of the studio or the gallery, and they were very interested for their work to circulate through other means. Um, for me, it was very important that they weren't for sale. Um, this wasn't sort of an ideological thing, but you know, from my experience running a fanzine and trying to get stores to take them, and you know, the fanzine costs like 40 cents or something, and then to try and get them to give you 10 cents when they'd sold a copy, it was a really excruciating process. Uh, but it was also really disappointing when things didn't sell. And I wanted to avoid that disappointment of being rejected by the marketplace. Because as a young person, I'd always love to go to record stores or bookshops and find stuff in the bargain bin. But I thought if you were in a band and went into a record store and saw your record in the dollar bin, you must know immediately that your career is over, that it's, it's done. And I thought there was something really uh, tragic and poignant about the marketplace. So I thought the best way to deal with that was to avoid it. So they only ever circulated in this sort of gray area. Um, and to this date, they've never really been um, published or uh, I don't talk about it apart from in contexts like this. Uh, and inevitably, uh, they're now very rare within the antiquarian book collecting circles, which you know, is something I think I was aware of at the time. Uh, this is just another example of some of the things I published. 
Uh, I'll just point out one. my French. Uh, it's by a British writer and performer called Stuart Home, who actually has a show up at White Columns uh, right now. And he's a very kind of important sort of uh, subcultural figure, kind of like a cult figure. And uh, he wrote this uh, short story, uh, Cunt Lickers Anonymous, and it's about the British artists Gilbert and George. And in the story, he's outing them as being heterosexual. So outing was, uh, of gay people was a very kind of contentious issue at this time. It was very prominent in the news and the media. So he did a kind of reverse process where he outed somebody, who two artists who appeared to be gay, but he was outing them as if they were straight. And also in the story, there's a character called Rachel Whitebait, who's a very thinly disguised Rachel Whitereed. This is around 93 or 4, I think, when she made her famous sculpture house. And in the story, she sends her studio assistants into the East End of London uh, to murder members of the working class. The East End of London is typically, where, historically, where the working class lived. Bring their bodies back to her studio, where she removed their lungs. And then she filled their lungs with concrete so that she could make a negative cast of the breath of the working class, which would be the most working class sculpture possible. Whilst I was doing this, I, you know, I was just keeping thinking about how I can work with artists, other kind of contexts I can work with, uh, things that we you know, slip literally below the radar. And the Guardian newspaper in Britain, sort of the leading left uh, broadsheet newspaper, and every, at the time on Valentine's Day, they used to publish a supplement of Valentine's messages that um, people would pay for. So if you wanted to you know, make a message in public space to your partner, you would phone them up and book your ad and give them your credit card details and so forth. And it would appear in the uh, newspaper on February the 14th. And I always used to read it. Um, I always thought it was really interesting, the kind of language that was used and the relationship between language and economy, because each word cost a certain amount of money. There was a kind of brevity to these things that had an economic status. Uh, but also the language used in it often, I think, reminded me of art. And I started to commission artists each year to make anonymous Valentine's works. And they were published within the context of The Guardian. And we never told anyone about them, so they just appeared. Um, this is one that starts Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. And it's by Elizabeth Payton. And it's uh, a message that Oscar Wilde sent to Lord Alfred Douglas when Oscar Wilde was in exile in France. And the idea was that somebody might just come across them. So there was this idea that there was a kind of unrequitedness in the gesture that the artist and myself obviously would never be aware of the work's reception. This one was by Jeremy Della, an artist who I've worked with a lot. And uh, it's the one that begins, I am human. And it says, I am human and I need to be loved just like everybody else does. And some of you might recognize it as a very famous lyric by the Smiths and Morrissey. And, um, I thought Jeremy Deller understood this context of sort of mutual love and exchange really well because within the middle of it there was this kind of sad, lonely desperation, which of course Morrissey probably understood even better. And the only anecdote worth repeating about this is at the time, in the early 90s, you used to phone up The Guardian and speak to a real person to book your ad. So the, I remember ringing up and the lady saying, you know, what's your message? And I said, you know, I'm human and I need to be loved just like everybody else does. And then she told me to say it much slower and it didn't sound like the Morrissey anymore. It sounded like this very sad person on the other end of the line. And then she repeated it back to me even slower. And uh, at that point I gave her, you know, a credit card number. But I think all of these things were born out of a desire to work with artists. And it was also born out of sort of necessity that I didn't have any, any in, in, extra income. I certainly didn't have a platform for these ideas but it allowed me to start to develop an idea or an identity of myself as a curator and to start to think about working with artists as my practice. Uh, not necessarily as a curator, but that was my actual practice. Uh, and that sort of extended to working with a group of artists and we worked in the early days of a space in London called Cubit, uh, which is still in existence today and it was an artist run space in the kind of classical model of an artist run space. And five or six of us tried to collectively do the programming. And uh, if you've ever tried to work collectively in a not-for-profit organization, it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, it's incredibly challenging. It's very occasionally rewarding. But for the most of the time, it's just really annoying. You sort of, it's a really poor dynamic between human beings uh, to try and do stuff together. And I think for me, it was a really important lesson not to do it again. Uh, so it was very necessary three years to go through working with or struggling with other people towards developing a, a space and a program uh, 
but it sort of reminded me of how much I enjoy working by myself. Uh, this was one of the shows at Cuba. The space was in King's Cross at the time, and this is a uh, 95, and this is a piece by Martin Creed. Uh, it's called The Lights On, and then The Lights Off. And the lights were on for 30 seconds, and then the lights go back on for 30 seconds. And it's the piece that he won the Turner Prize uh, with in 2001, I guess six years later. Uh, but certainly for me, it was just, it was thinking about being more public. It was about thinking, having a, a different kind of platform and a different kind of context. And by this time, I think, in the sort of mid-90s, uh, I started to think about myself as a curator. And at, at this point, I was only working independently. Um, I was paying for all of the projects I was doing myself. I was very keen not to apply for grants or funding of any kind. I felt like uh, I'd be forced to think about the outcomes or to try and define what I was trying to do or achieve. And that wasn't even a thought in my head. So the idea that I might have to do that in order to secure funding for something, I did the, the things rationalized before it happened. At that point in my life, it wasn't something I was necessarily interested in engaging with. And I also felt there was space for disappointment again, that the funders would reject you. And uh, the easiest way to avoid rejection is to not get involved in situations where you can be rejected. It's probably not very good for human development, but... Uh, I started to get invited to curate shows in all kinds of places, and this happened quite organically, but certainly by the mid to late 90s, I was organizing a lot of exhibitions in all kinds of places. This is just one example. These are from old 35 millimeter slides, so they're a bit blown out. And this was a space in London called The Approach, and uh, I think it was indicative of my approach to making exhibitions at the time. The exhibition was called A to Z, which is the alphabet in the British language, English language. Um, and the, really, the, it was just looking at text-based art. And um, certainly within my own practice, I'd always had an interest in this kind of work. I'd always been interested in any kind of language-based art from Dada, Picasso, Braque onwards. So I was interested in what a, a language-based or language-oriented show might look like at that point in time. And the, the, the idea was to create a 100 artists group show uh, on no budget and just see what happened. And this space was above a pub in the East End of London. It's now a gallery in the same space. Uh, but for me, it was an interesting opportunity to present all of the things I was interested in or a lot of the things I was interested in simultaneously. Uh, and that included a lot of work by senior artists, a lot of uh, work by artists of my generation, and then also a work by a lot of younger artists that I was meeting through teaching. By this time, I'd started teaching at uh, Chelsea College of Art, uh, and then eventually Goldsmiths and the Royal College. Um, the only reason I was showing the slides is I really like this artwork in the middle of the space, and it's by a South African artist called Laura Elmsley, who was living in London at the time. And uh, what you're seeing is a, a sculptural, a large sculptural object, and what she did was she bought, she found the reading list for a philosophy master's student from the University of London, and she bought all of the books on this reading list and then turned them into paper pulp. So what you're seeing is the different colors of the papers and turn into pulp. And the piece is called Cave. And what I thought was really beautiful about it, I think there's all kinds of things that are really beautiful about the work, but it's literally constructed of language. But I thought it was also trying to find a practical use for philosophy. So it's literally a shelter constructed from philosophical thought. And uh, there was really something magical about it as an object. Uh, it reminded me very much of that famous Smithson drawing called Heap of Language. And I thought we had this really, you know, this beautiful structure literally constructed out of language. And certainly the way that she'd shredded and pulped the paper is that some of the text was legible in its fragmented uh, state when you were very close to the work. But this would have been a typical wall in the show where all kinds of information is presented simultaneously, where you can't really distinguish or make separations between one kind of artist's work or another. The sort of salon hang was something I was very interested in at that time. Um, it allowed me to make connections across history and time between artists who might not actually have any kind of relationship and also to think about the exhibition as a kind of temporary idea so that this thing unfolds in time over four weeks, five weeks, however long the show is, but that's its time spent together and then the work goes back to being itself. Uh, this is my favorite work in the show and it's uh, by a really great uh, British Indian artist called Tariq Alvi and uh, it's an appropriated image I guess from the late 80s or early 90s, and I think he found it in a, a Dutch sex newspaper. Uh, but what I really like about the image uh, is that you don't know what caused the erection. Uh, obviously, the idea is that he's reading some kind of erotic literature, 
But I prefer the idea that just reading in itself is a libidinal act. Um, jumping quite quickly to 2001, um, by this time I was working as the uh, Associate Director of Exhibitions at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts and uh, I got invited to make an exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery in London with an artist called Paul Noble uh, who'd been a friend for a long time and he'd set up a really great space with his friends called City Racing. We both come from very similar social backgrounds. We both grew up in the north of England and uh, I think for both of us our uh, sort of uh, uh, consciousness as uh, individuals really changed around 1978 and into 79, and particularly in 1979 where Margaret Thatcher came into power. Uh, British culture and British life changed uh, then, and I think even as 14 or 15 years old, it was, trans it was obvious that something was wrong. And both myself and Paul independently, we didn't know each other at the time, sort of got involved with grassroots politics. There was a, a movement came out of the music scene called Rock Against Racism, uh, but there was also a renewed interest in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, CND in the UK. These became very kind of strong social forces. And certainly as you know, a relatively naive uh, uh, person, I, I became involved in these locally in, this, in the town that I lived in. Uh, we made an exhibition together, it's called Protest and Survive. And Protest and Survive was the, the rallying cry of the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the 1950s. And I think a lot of people thought the exhibition was a, a nostalgic exhibition uh, about the relationship between art and politics. And the exhibition opened in 2000. Um, that wasn't really our intent or our interest at all. I think what we were interested in was how politics affects individuals, but also how individuals can affect politics. Uh, and it was about the sort of this tension between these two ideas, about between the individual and in the space and society. Uh, we didn't make a press release for the show, which I think in hindsight created some of the confusion as to our intentions. Uh, instead, we put this cartoon in the front of the gallery. And this was published in a British satirical magazine uh, the week that Tate Modern opened on the banks of the River Thames where a former power station had been transformed into a heritage or culture site. And this sort of, the heritage culture thing in Britain was very widely discussed at the time where Britain's manufacturing industries had completely collapsed. Obviously the legacy of its empire had gone. And Britain had moved from being, you know, a powerhouse industrially and in manufacturing terms to trading on its heritage culture, which of course is not unique to the UK, but it's a very kind of compelling narrative at the time. And of course, Tate Modern was a kind of very solid example of, of those, those two ideas uh, being mixed. So in the cartoon, you see this sort of old working class guy, uh, you know, saying one day, son, all this will be art galleries, where historically, it would have been a job for life for the young person, doing the same job his father did and his family did and so forth. And, um, this was a kind of uh, statement of intent for the show. But the show itself was uh, all kinds of works, I think, that we felt uh, uh, conjured up this sort of, this sort of alienation, and the, that sort of sense of social alienation and psychological alienation, you know, was perhaps best articulated by Guy Debord and the Situationist International and the Society of the Spectacle. And this work by Christopher Wool and uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, a collaborative piece they made, one of their poster stacks that you can take one home has this very famous situationist text that says the show is over, the audience get up to leave their seats, time to collect their coats and go home. They turn around, no more coats and no more home. So whilst people are being distracted by the spectacle, the world around them's collapsed. And uh, we were interested in sort of thinking about this in relation to all kinds of art that might fall within a very kind of loose umbrella of the political. In the background, you see a work by David Hammonds, one of the higher goals, basketball hoop pieces. And on the right, you see a series of photographs by Paul Graham, a British photographer taken in 1984. And a lot of works in the show were dated 1984, which we didn't mention to anyone either, but obviously just playing off that sort of, uh, the specter of the sort of Orwellian future. These are photographs by Paul Graham taken in British unemployment offices in the early 1980s. Uh, at the sort of height at that time of the unemployment in the UK. And this sort of dehumanization in the process of uh, p people collecting their benefits, which of course they were perfectly entitled to because you know, they'd contributed through uh, taxes in order to receive those benefits. But it sort of documents a kind of almost like early 20th century poverty, but this use of color I think in these photographs it sort of changes them completely. Uh, this was a piece in the show that uh, uh, I remain really happy it happened and proud of, I guess. Uh, we invited the Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn to make a new work for the show. 
And uh, he proposed two things, and only one of them could be realized for expense reasons. And this was the work that was realized, which is called the bridge. And uh, where you find yourself is in the cafe of the Whitechapel Art Gallery. It's on the second floor, the ground floor, and then the second floor in England. So it's above street level. And this is an alleyway that you look down on. And across the alleyway, where you see the windows, is a very, very famous publisher called the Freedom Press, which is the oldest anarchist publisher in Europe. It's been around for about 100 years, as long as the Whitechapel Gallery has been there. And the Whitechapel Gallery was started with a very specific mission. It was to bring the most radical art to the working class communities of London. From the day it opened, that was its mission. So it's always had an extraordinarily interesting threshold. And the neighborhood it's in has been a very contentious neighborhood. Uh, over the last century. It was where the British Fascist Party tried to establish itself and was uh, forced out. It was home recently to very large Bengali uh, Indian communities. And more recently, as the City of London's financial district expanded, that community has, you know, has been displaced too. So it's always been about a history of displacements. Um, what we were amazed by, myself and Paul, is that the staff of the uh, Whitechapel Art Gallery had never been into the Freedom Press's bookshop. And it's literally 12 feet away. But you have to go down to the street, down an alley, and around the back and up the stairs and into the bookstore. But it's really one of the best bookstores for kind of humanitarian, libertarian thought. And Thomas Hirschhorn independently had this extraordinary idea to connect the two institutions by building a bridge from the cafe straight through the wall of the Freedom Press and into their bookstore. So this is looking down into the alleyway below. This is the bridge itself from the cafe going straight through the wall into the, and on the other side's a happy anarchist. <laughs> and for the two months the show was open, there was a flow between the two organizations. And the anarchists told me that like, their takings went up like 10,000% or something. So they were really happy that they could you know, publish more things. But also I think we liked, or I think what was very interesting was Hirschhorn's idea of the bridge, about the idea of uh, art being kind of connecting between two different sets of ideas or two different concerns. His other proposal, which would have been beautiful, was to dig a hole in the main space of the Whitechapel Gallery, and go down about 15 feet and dig a tunnel and come up 15 feet into the public library next door. So he wanted to connect the three institutions. We couldn't afford to do the library one. But to this day, I'm still amazed the Whitechapel agreed to do the bridge. Uh, I remember going to the meeting and they said, sure. And I was really, really impressed that it was that easy. Um, I, I left England in 2001, so I've been away from uh, the UK for a, a decade now. And uh, there were all kinds of reasons why I was interested to leave. At the time, I would have been 36. Uh, I was working at the ICI. I had been working with artists in London for probably the best part of 10 years. And uh, I certainly felt on a very kind of personal level that uh, it, was, it would be time for me to take my baggage somewhere else and see what happens. Uh, I certainly felt that. I could identify an audience in London. There was an audience for the work I was doing. Uh, it wasn't like a prescriptive response to the work, but I certainly felt on a very personal level it just wasn't that interesting to me anymore. I think I was very fortunate to be there through the 1990s when really extraordinary things happened. But certainly for me at least, uh, it felt like it changed and it felt like an interesting time to go somewhere else. And um, I got uh, opportunities to work in San Francisco um, at the Waters Institute. I'd only been to uh, San Francisco once before um, for you know, a week, uh, but I liked it. But I, I knew a lot about San Francisco and its political and social histories and some of its cultural histories, and obviously it's extraordinarily interesting for all those things. But I certainly wasn't an expert. And I was interested in just really going somewhere and starting again. Uh, so I would show up in town with nothing in mind and then really just think about how, how do you start again in a new place? What does it mean to start again in a new place? How do you introduce yourself, your ideas, the things you're interested in in a new place? And the Waters Institute's a, a gallery on the campus of an art school, not dissimilar to this. And I've always been very interested in the, the art school gallery. I think certainly in the 1970s in the US and in the UK especially, they were really like laboratories. A lot of really extraordinarily important things took place at campus galleries. And I think that changed certainly in the UK in the 80s with the introduction of Thatcher and more uh, different policies towards art culture and how it's supported through, through governmental sources and so forth. So I certainly felt that the, the, the power had been somewhat diminished. Uh, but I was interested in the idea that the gallery existed between the general public 
but also the school where art was thought about, discussed, and made. And it was really an in interesting threshold for me, and it's a threshold I remain very interested in. And this was the first exhibition I made in San Francisco, and it was called To Whom It May Concern. Um, to Whom It May Concern is a, a phrase that I really like. It's an extremely complicated form of address, I think. Each word of it is very interesting, you know, to whom it may and concern. They're all really loaded. Um, but what I was interested in making was a, an exhibition, or I thought I was making an exhibition about art as a communicative vehicle and how successful it is as a communicative vehicle. But the more I got into making the show, and actually once it was installed, I realized that that wasn't necessarily what the show was about at all. In fact, the, the show was really about art's failure uh, as a communicative vehicle. And the show really consisted of works that weren't intended for the viewer. So typically, you know, you stand in front of a painting and you're the receiver and that's the relationship. But in each of the works in this show, the, the viewer acted as a kind of interloper so that the information in the work, whether it was fictional or real, was actually intended for someone else. So you took on the role of a kind of eavesdropper or an interloper within the work itself. And this was the first work you saw. It's by a Canadian artist called Angela Bullock who's living in Berlin. And uh, it's from her ongoing series of works called the Rules Series where she's looking for authoritarian language wherever it manifests itself. So in the rules that apply to the military and the rules that apply to people who work for certain businesses, every time she finds another manifestation of authoritarian language, she adds it to this ongoing body of work, uh, which is called the Rules Series. And this was a piece called Baby Doll Saloon. Uh, it's interesting because it relates to uh, some of the works that are currently up at Stewart's Place. Uh, the Baby Doll Saloon was a strip club in Tribeca. It's no longer there. And Angela found these rules handwritten and taped to the back of the bathroom door in the women's bathroom. So it's the rules that the women who worked in the strip club had to abide by. And um, if you look at them, they seem quite benign. So if you look at um, number seven, which you know, makes it seem like a very kind of you know, nice employer that A, you might do drugs and they're okay with that and they'd rather you didn't bring them to work, which leaves space for you to bring them to work. But if you look at the line above, it says the management reserves the right to fire you without notice or reason. And I think she was very interested in these contradictions that exist within all authoritarian structures uh, between this sort of uh, benign external appearance, but at the heart there's something really much more fundamentally corrupt. So obviously this information wasn't intended for any of the viewers in the show, but it was, it was re-contextualized by the artist. Here you see three works by Felix Gonzalez Torres, Jeffrey Valance, and Joseph Gridgley. And Joseph Gridgley's work, I don't know if you know Joseph's work, but he's an artist based in Chicago, but since the age of nine, he's been completely deaf. Uh, so for the last 40 plus years, he's, he's had no hearing. And in a lot of his work, he, uh, uses the kind of complicatedness of communicating with people as part of the subject of his work. So this is a reconstruction of a conversation he had in a cafe. Uh, so what you see on the table is handwritten notes from the person he was with, handwriting props from the server. When he's not able to lip read or understand what you're trying to say through lip reading, he'll ask you to jot down your thoughts on a piece of paper and then he'll reply to you. And it's extremely difficult to write down what you're thinking very quickly. It's really hard to do, just to all of a sudden translate what you're thinking into a written language. And in a lot of Joseph's earlier works, he'd made these kind of constellations of these handwritten notes where they're often around a single subject. And I remember seeing a really beautiful piece that was about 100 notes written at different times that were all about music, where I think Joseph's asking someone he's with, what does the band sound like? Or what's the music in this room? And uh, there was a really great note in one of them, I remember. It said something like, uh, they sound like the new Nirvana. And I thought it was a really profound misunderstanding of Joseph's situation because he doesn't know what the old Nirvana sound like. <laughs> and I thought within this sort of discrepancy, uh, that was what the show was about. It was about the, the, the space within art for us to get it wrong, for us to miscommunicate, and for a lack of communication uh, to exist. This was a work by Ken Lum. Uh, really one of my favorite group of works made. They're fictional signs for small businesses in the Vancouver area. And uh, when you see a lot of them together, you sort of get a map of the city, you get a map of its suburbs, you get a map of its different kinds of communities. Um, but this one I put in the show is from Jim and Susan's Motel. And uh, I think at the bottom, 
all of a sudden you get this amazing threshold between pro public and private space. And I think this is what the show is also interested in, was this sort of uh, uncomfortable tension that exists between things that should be unsaid and things that then become public. And obviously Jim's done something terrible. Uh, he's probably tried the best he can privately to bring Susan back and to make amends, but it clearly didn't work. So out of desperation, he's put it into the public domain. So in these seven words, Sue, I am sorry, please come back, you get a sort of Flaubert-like narrative of a family falling apart, the hopes and dreams of starting this small business, and all of a sudden it's just condensed into this sort of very sort of uh, haiku-like uh, image of desperation. I realize uh, I've been going for about 50 minutes, so I'm gonna, I've barely started. So I'm gonna work out how to end quite soon, but I've literally barely started, so I apologize for that. Uh, one of the great things about making a move from the UK to somewhere else uh, was the opportunity to work with different kinds of artists, and uh, this would be an example that myself and Ralph Rugoff, who were running the Waters at the time, uh, we inherited the legacy of a thing called a Cap Street residency where artists were invited to spend time in David Ireland's former home in the Mission and respond to it. By the time we got there, David Ireland's home was no longer the site of the residency. It was much more informal how the artists chose to respond. And we made this amazing project with Mike Kelly. Well, really, Mike Kelly made the project, but we invited him to do it. And this was the first time Mike Kelly had shown a work of art in San Francisco, which I actually found unbelievable. And this was like 2003. And he lives in, he's lived in Los Angeles since 1977. It seemed completely impossible to me that one of the most interesting artists of all time who lives nearby had never been invited to show in San Francisco. And he made this really extraordinary work, which was an homage not only to David Ireland, but to many other things. And um, it's quite complicated what you're looking at. But what you're seeing in the center of the space Uh, originally in the backyard of Mike's house in Los Angeles and it had been made by the previous owners and it sort of has a sort of folk art Tatlin's Tower look about it. Uh, it's very beautifully welded but it's sort of very handmade and what it's doing in the space is rotating. Uh, it's two motors attached to chains and attached to the rotating spiral staircase are three video projectors and the light show. And the light show is a sort of homage to the Fillmore and to the psychedelic area in the San Francisco Bay Area. The motors are connected to a guitar amplifier with effects pedals. So the piece is generating its own soundtrack. It's generating like a drone music, which is also an homage to some of the things that were going on in the Bay Area, the sort of Eastern influence on Bay Area composition at that time in the late 60s. But what's being projected on the three screens are, on one screen is the series of images that Mike found in his garage when he bought the property. And it shows the previous owners of his home in what was their space, now his space. Clearly, probably in the 80s, late 70s, some earlier time. So this was appearing on one of the screens. On the second screen, Mike restaged all of these photographs in the present tense, using himself for the former family members. <laughs> so Mike filled the pool in. So this was going on the second one. So all of a sudden there was the older history of the house, there was the new history of the house, which is very much about David Ireland's idea of sort of excavating the past. And then on the third set of slides was the images juxtaposed, where they started to ghostly appear within both past and present simultaneously. And Mike wrote this really beautiful um, essay about this piece. Uh, but I thought it was a really extraordinary, remarkable uh, thing. But for me at least it was a, you know, really interesting thrill to work with artists like Mike Kelly, who I'd read about at art school 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, and the idea that uh, these kind of sort of narratives might unfold, the sort of uh, serendipitous uh, nature of uh, working organically within culture. Whilst I was at the uh, Wattis, and I am going to finish quite soon, uh, outside of my office, I started a project called the Bulletin Board, and it was really just perhaps thinking more like the Valentine's Day projects, thinking about an existing structure and how you might intervene into that structure in a quite modest way, uh, and a, another opportunity to work with artists outside of, you know, the more conventional context. And the Bulletin Board was placed exactly at the entrance to the school, exactly where you'd expect to find one. And obviously, you gravitate towards Bulletin Boards for useful inf or pertinent information. And I just thought it would be interesting to replace the useful and pertinent information with art, which is possibly neither pertinent nor useful. So I started to commission artists to make work for this space. This was a presentation by a Bay Area photographer called Jim Jacoy, 
of uh, these sort of doubled Polaroids he'd been taking. He very famously documented the San Francisco punk scene in the late 70s uh, in a book called We're Desperate. Um, but he was someone who I don't think really would describe himself as an artist. And I was very interested to work with people from the Bay Area that uh, I'd always been interested in. And it was just an opportunity to work with people on a very modest scale. This was a display by the Bay Area sort of Dadaist Monte Cazaza, who'd worked very closely with a British group, Throbbing Gristle, that I'd been interested in. And he presented all of these limited edition records made by a French label in the late 70s and early 1980s. So again, it was just thinking about the, the bulletin board as a kind of frame, literally, but it was also a kind of vitrine. Uh, it was a kind of sort of vehicle for the presentation of information. Uh, this is a work by Tricia Donnelly, a Bay Area-based artist at the time who now lives in New York City. And again, it was just a very sort of simple way uh, to make work with artists. And I think this, this sort of re remains for me the kind of uh, the compelling thing. And um, I moved to, from the Bay Area in two, late 2004 to New York to become the director of White Columns. And uh, as Stuart mentioned, White Columns is the oldest of the sort of first generation alternative art spaces. It was founded in 1970 by Jeffrey Liu and Gordon Matter Clark. And it's a space that I'd been interested in for a long time. Um, but certainly by the time I got there, I felt that it somehow, not lost its way exactly, but it certainly wasn't functioning in a way that it should, or that I felt it should. And for me, it was, uh, it was interesting to think about a historical organization, think about its legacy, but also to think about how do you make an organization like that relevant again in the present tense. And certainly when I talked to the board, uh, when I was being interviewed for the position, I talked about a 10-year project. Uh, my feeling was that it would fully take 10 years for us to realize something. It would take us fully 10 years to make a difference. Uh, and I think it would fully take 10 years for it to become apparent what it was we were trying to do. And we're into year six and a half of that 10-year curve. And I think that's, you know, it, it seems like quite a long-term commitment to something. But for me, at least, it's, it's been always interesting thinking about it as a very long-term project. And that everything we've done at White Columns uh, during that time is contributing to a much larger narrative. So it's not necessarily about each individual show, although they're very, they're very important, but it's about how each individual show brings something different to the narrative. And I think during that time, six and a half years, I've organized, I think, 200 shows at White Columns alone. And uh, the goal really is to work with as many people as possible within our financial constraints but also to work with as many different kinds of people as possible, to try and reflect something of the, what I think is the, the, the true complexity of visual culture. So the goal is that each time you come to the space, it's substantially very different from the previous time you came. So if you come all the time, it's important to me that it feels different. If you only come occasionally, it's important that it feels radically different. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a work in progress, and I certainly think about it as one idea, even though it comprises many other kinds of ideas. And the central thing, I think, for me is to create a network, an organic conversation amongst artists that didn't exist before. So all of the people who've participated in our programs in that time, I feel have uh, only one thing in common, is that they have some kind of relationship with White Columns. Uh, I'm going to end on this show, and I'll just very briefly describe it, because it was the first show I made at White Columns. And uh, it was interesting moving from San Francisco after three years to, to New York. The same thing is like, how do you introduce yourself? How do you make work in a new city that has so many histories? Uh, how do you negotiate all of the different interests? How do you negotiate all the different kind of uh, generational uh, things at play within a city like New York City? And how, so you, how do you also make work within a historical framework of a space like White Collins? And I made an exhibition uh, uh, that was, um, well, it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was based around, uh, it was called Trade. So the, the, the title of the show played on the idea of the marketplace, uh, also on the idea of exchange. Uh, but what I was interested in was that every time I visited an artist at their home or studio, they always had a great artwork on the wall by another artist. And in 99.9% .9 of cases, they'd swapped that work with another artist. And it became like an amazing narrative over 20 years that you just kept seeing these extraordinary artworks in other people's homes or spaces. And each time you realize that two people out of kind of mutual respect, friendship, shared concerns, had decided that these two works had equal value and they chose to swap them. So it was, a, it was an economy where no money changed hands. And I think, and I'm sure I'm right, it's the largest economy in the art world. 
but it's one that's never discussed. So the only economy that's discussed is huge auction prices, escalating sales, and so forth. But for me, what I became interested in was the idea that there's this vast economy that remains completely obscured. So I wanted to make an exhibition that dealt with um, this idea, but also that sort of uh, reunited White Calms with some of its constituent audiences. So I invited 15 artists from very different backgrounds, from very different generations, from di very different kinds of work, very different kind of interests and so forth, and asked them to introduce me to one artist that they'd traded work with in the past. So I came up with 15. They introduced me to another 15 artists, and it became 30 artists involved with the show. And then the show reunited the traded objects. And we published a small fanzine that just had some accounts about the nature of the exchanges and how they came about and so forth. And they were just hung together as pairs. So the works were being presented together for the first time simultaneously. And for me, it was just a really interesting exhibition. It was my first show at the space. All kinds of people came to the opening because all kinds of different people had some kind of relationship. There were a lot of very kind of unlikely pairings where you wouldn't necessarily have thought that these things made sense. Some made absolute sense because there was such a kind of shared sensibility and so forth. But for me, it was also a, a, a kind of statement of intent. It was about saying this is an exhibition about something artists have created for themselves, by themselves, that exists outside of any other kind of external economic forces. And in a way, it was trying to think about why Jeffrey Liu and Gordon Matter Clark started White Comms. It was to create a context and a platform for artists uh, on their own terms. So it's sort of trying to think about that idea of uh, a context created by artists for artists, which is the primary uh, mission uh, of white comms as, 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 as an idea. Um, I'll leave it on this image. This was a, from that show, and it's works by Kim Gordon, uh, who's the, also the bass player from Sonic Youth. But as an artist, she had her first show at white comms in 1980. It was an opportunity to reunite the organization with people who'd worked there in the past. And uh, the German artist, uh, Jutta Kurta. And this was their pairing of things that they'd exchanged. Uh, both as artists who collaborated, but also as works that they'd made together in public space and then given to each other coming out of that. So it was like a restaging of the friendship. Um, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I've only just got to New York, and that was uh, eight years ago, seven years ago. But um, if there are any questions, I'd be really happy to try and answer them. Um, you know, I think primarily, as Stuart mentioned, the thing that I'm interested in personally is sort of sustaining my relationship to being a practicing artist. I think the idea of the artist writer, the artist curator, the artist collector, and so on, this sort of hybrid identity of the artist is something I've always been interested in. I also think there's some truth in the idea that artists do things differently when they approach writing or curating. You know, it, it might be as cliched as artistic license that allows them to behave differently when they're working in a different discipline or medium. But certainly for myself, I'm interested in sustaining a practice as an artist, as a curator, occasionally as a writer. I write far less often than I used to. As an educator, I've taught for many years, but less so recently. And also as someone who's responsible for a space, and also as a publisher. So I've uh, continued to publish things. We published um, 42 issues of a fanzine at White Columns over the last five years. And we started a small record label called The Sound of White Columns which releases uh, records that somehow relate to artists' interests in music. But um, I'm interested in where these disciplines sort of overlap, uh, but I'm equally interested in why they're different. And I think it's probably why they're different that I find it most interesting when I'm trying to negotiate it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, just to end, um, I think if you'd told me when I was, uh, you know, 15 or 16 that, you know, you could make you know, have a productive life, make a living, working with artists. That would have seemed like a, an insane idea to me as a young person. So, you know, I think the fact that one is able to do that, you know, it seems to me an extraordinary privilege. And uh, it's something, you know, I take very seriously. I certainly take running white columns very seriously because I feel like, you know, I'm just a temporary custodian for an extraordinary idea because I think when Geoffrey Liu and Gordon Matter Clark set that idea in motion, it really created the whole alternative art space movement in the United States and beyond. And so it's important for me and you know, the, the other people who work at White Columns that we, we look after the idea whilst we're in, you know, looking in charge of it. So thank you. Um, if you have questions, I'd be really happy to address them. They can be about anything at all. <laughs>
goes to the history of the band culture that we talked about, but also obviously the kind of of history and the other that was on their own, kind of gathering information over a long period of time. <coughs> Were there promoters, producers, people either in the art world or the music world or the other world that you were interested in, who were role models or the kind of activities that you found yourself doing? Um. Well, I, I, well, you know, dozens of people. I think, you know, I mean, when I was, you know, this age, um, you know, I had no experience of the world. I lived in a small town. Um, you know, my external stimulus was quite limited uh, until something came along that immediately interested me. And um, quite quickly, I think, uh, I became curious about how, how it came to be. It didn't just happen by accident. It wasn't happening by itself. And, it was obvious that people, many people, made a decision to do something, uh, to start something, to create something, to make something happen. And um, obviously this time I didn't know what art was. I had no interest in art. So it was happening in the public realm. Otherwise I would have been unaware of its existence. But it struck me as an incredibly generous gesture. And I think that's what I always couldn't get my head around, was that somebody would go to all the trouble to organize something logistically quite complicated, potentially financially disastrous, in order to create a context for something interesting and for other people to share in that context. And that's what I picked up from this kind of culture. Um, certainly, if you look at Factory Records, which was the label that Tony Wilson and a couple of other people, the, the designer Peter Savlin, started, it just seemed to me extraordinary. It just seemed like astonishing that four people could come up with such an extraordinary idea and then make it happen. And it you know, progressively ruined their lives, I think, financially and personally. But they stuck with it. And um, I think this, for me, was just a really uh, an, an amazing idea that people would go and do that. And of course, it happens all the time in all kinds of contexts. It's not just to do with this. But it sort of, uh, it just left kind of very powerful, or it sowed the seed of something, I think, quite powerful at the time, but I didn't really know what to do with it. So my initial answer was to start a fanzine, because I'd seen other people with them. So it was really just mimicking something I'd seen in the culture, but all of a sudden I had a vehicle for my, you know, naive thoughts. I was recently at the New York Art Book Fair at PS1, where you know there's all kinds of publishers, but rare book dealers, and there's a really great guy in New York who sells rare music fanzines. And they're very expensive, like 100, 150, 200 dollars each, and he had the first two issues of my fanzine, and uh, I hadn't seen them for at least 20 years, and I was shocked to read my you know, poorly typed text that I wrote when I was 14, trying to have ideas about things. Uh, and you know, it, it was interesting to see it again because it, I remember doing it. I could remember typing every word. Um, but it just seemed important to me for myself to get out of my situation through trying to participate in the culture, to try and get closer to the thing that I was interested in. And that seemed at the time like a vehicle. And then I think when I was 16, I started a label releasing music on cassette tapes, which was you know, the, the then new medium. Um, and then I think around age 16, I started promoting concerts in my hometown. And um, each was a desire just to you know, make something happen, because if I didn't do it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, but at the same time, I think it was also trying to locate oneself into you know, the social milieu to try and you know, create an audience that might then become, you know, peers, collaborators, and so forth. And that's followed through into the art context, too. But certainly, you know, I think organizing concerts was interesting. It's an incredibly stressful thing to do. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but, in, you know, the, I organized New Order's first advertised concert when I was 16. And uh, it was in a room, you know, s smaller than, you know, about this size, the front of this, in front of the chairs. So it was like this big. And uh, you know, I just remember panicking for the week before, worrying that no one was going to come because they weren't known. Uh, that, that it was only six months since he'd killed himself. I'm just panicking all week that no one's going to come, and I was going to lose 30 pounds or something, which is how much it had cost me to book the community center. And then, like 400 people showed up, and uh, I think I charged one pound 25, which would be about less than two dollars. And I was on the door with Joy Division and New Order's manager, this really extraordinary human being called Rob Gretton. I mean, really one of the truly the greatest people I've ever met in my life. And everybody paid with coins, so there was just this big bag. And at the end of the night, because we'd never discussed it, I said to him, well, what should we do with the money? 
And he said, oh, keep it. And I just thought it was the most extraordinary thing, because I'd never seen that much money in my entire life. I mean, it was like 600 pounds, and it was a huge amount of money for me at the time. And it was all in coins, so I just remember filling all my pockets with all this money. And then, you know, it, was, it, it, it wasn't the money or the amount of the money, but it was the gesture. And it, it just stayed with me ever since. The, I thought it was just really a magnanimous gesture. And it felt every time I went to something, or every time I went to Manchester or Liverpool on the train, somebody else had done something great for me to be interested in. And it just felt a, like a self-replicating culture, which it was, I guess. Um, but it's interesting, you know, when you're, you know, you're, you're interested. Um, but, so that seemed important. Uh, so there are all kinds of people, you know, really specific people, but also more generally, I think the, that permission, I think, that punk opened up, uh, you know, was very significant, or, or shaped me a little bit, I think, at that time. Yep. Certainly, I think some things, you know, that you're unaware of its potential at the time come to the fore later. But I think everything else is very strategic. So the trade show is an extraordinarily strategic thing that I spent three months thinking about. How do I make a show in New York for a very smart audience? It's my first show in this space. There's a degree of expectation that it's a new director in a historical space. What's he going to do? So I think there's a kind of sort of there's a pressure. Uh, but it, regardless of that, I was trying to think about how can I say something about artists, how can I say something about the history of why it's meaningful to its audience, which is other artists. And it was thinking about this thing that, as I mentioned, I'd noticed over years, that every time I went to someone's house, they got something great, and it was a trade. And so for me, it's also like when I talked to the board when I was interviewed, talking about you know, my plans as 10 years which you know, 10 years seems like a really huge amount of time, but I remember September 11 like it was two minutes ago, and then a whole decade's just slipped by. So the idea of a 10-year investment in a set of concerns for me was something that I thought through when I was in San Francisco when I applied for the position. So it, it wasn't serendipitous, I think, and I think even when I was young, I was, uh, uh, you know, I was quite a very awkward person when I was young. And um, if you look at my fanzine, they're very mannered. It's not like casually thrown together. I was trying to s deal with things I was interested in, trying to filter it through myself and come up with something that felt like it was mine. But you know, they're very uh, informed by other things. And they're very self-conscious, I think, perhaps in that respect. So it, it wasn't serendipitous at all. And I think um, even like making a decision not to work in the art world in 1987, and then five years later just coming up with a small publishing project, it took me five years of hard thinking to come to what seems like an unremarkable idea. But what I hoped was that the idea was fully thought through by the time it appeared. So when the first one went out, I'd spent five years thinking about it. So it didn't just, it might, you know, if someone received it, they might have thought, what's this crap? But by the time they received the 40th one, they might get a sense of what I was trying to think about. So it's, I think it's, the exact, not the exact opposite of what you but it's uh, you know, very strategic. Um, because certainly for myself, that's the only way I can work. Is, um, but then, you know, I, I see stuff and then I can show it a, a week later at White Combs. And things can happen very quickly within that structure. And the, the, the goal really is to create a structure that's flexible. So that's why we've been able to do so many shows at White Combs. And, um, you know, I've, collaborated with an organization in Oakland for the last 10 years called Creative Growth. And it's a community of about 100 uh, mentally and developmentally disabled artists. It's an organization that's been around since the early 70s. And I think I've probably done work on maybe 20 projects now with Creative Growth and its artists in different contexts. And um, I was there about three months ago for some other reason. And um, I just saw this work by an artist who works there called John Hiltunen. Both he and his wife are mentally disabled. They both work at Creative Growth. And he was just making these extraordinary collages. I mean, they're just mind-blowingly great. Uh, 
And uh, I immediately got very, very excited about them. And they said people in Oakland weren't interested in them. So I showed them at White Column seven days later. Um, and it seems to me that that's serendipitous. But it's based within a narrative of working with an organization for 10 years where they trust me to, you know, hopefully reposition the work or recontextualize the work in a way that's meaningful for somebody. Um, but, um, yeah, maybe I think about things too much, actually. It's quite possible. Make it really good. You were seven years in London and you saw everything. Yeah. And I'm curious if, and when you were at the Northern England, you were limited in your access to information for a long period of time to get information. In this current era, how do you deal with seeing everything or that concept of, of, of absorbing information? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's complicated, I think, because, you know, I think when I was young and trying to find out about interesting things. You know, I, I, I felt I had a responsibility to find out about what I felt was the most interesting things happening in the culture during my time. So I, the reason I was watching Joy Division rehearsal on Sunday afternoons wasn't an accident. Somehow, age 13, I figured out that's about as interesting as it gets. And um, certainly my interest in art when I was very young um, I got interested in quite complicated art very quickly, I think, before I even really understood what it was. I remember buying secondhand uh, three catalogs that the Tate Gallery published in the late 70s. They did a series of three extraordinary shows, which I didn't see, because uh, I was too young. But they did shows with uh, Eve Klein, Piero Manzoni, and uh, Marcel Brotas. And I remember buying the catalogs secondhand probably when I was 17 or 16 and having no idea what I was looking at. I just couldn't understand the visual information on the page. And I read the text, and I didn't really understand what they were talking about or what it meant. Um, but it certainly triggered you know, a desire to pursue those links. And um, I remember being interviewed for undergraduate uh, at Newcastle. And then when the interview uh, was over, uh, one of the people interviewed, one of the artists who worked at the school, uh, one of the tutors, just as an aside, said to me, how come you know so much about art? And I didn't know how to re reply, uh, apart from what I said was I, I thought that was the idea. Um, and I realized then that you know, there's, there, there's a strong possibility that as an unformed 18-year-old, I knew more about art than the people that were about to teach me. But today, I don't know. It's, um, it, it's complicated. You know, White Combs has an online curated registry where we encourage artists to send their work to White Combs. So 4,000 artists a year send me work to review, which is a lot. I promise you it's a lot. Uh, but on top of that, I'm obviously I'm doing my own independent research, and I try and see everything in New York that you know, comes into my radar that I feel is you know, important for me to make some kind of sense of. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's overwhelming. Uh, the access to information we have is overwhelming. And you know, I'm obviously of an age where you couldn't Google Situationist International and find out everything within an hour's worth of research. It took me, as I said, 10 years to get some vague idea about what that might mean. So obviously, you know, what, I don't know what kind of culture that's going to produce because I don't think we know yet. I don't know what kind of information it's going to produce. And uh, certainly for me, I think running uh, White Columns, we're trying to do two things simultaneously. We're trying to do things very quickly, which is why we've done 200 plus shows. It's why we've published 40 odd issues of a fanzine. We're also trying to do something really slow, which is think about an idea over a decade. So we're trying to allow these two ideas to coexist, which is to do a lot of things very quickly, but then also to think about something much slower in culture and then see what happens when those two ideas uh, you know, settle. Um, but you know, as I you know, mentioned at the beginning, the thing that I'm really interested in is disco music. Um, I mean, that's, that is the actual thing that I spend most of my time with, and it's the only thing I spend most of my money on. And it's the thing that I find most interesting in life. And uh, the access we have to information related to that you know, has transformed my hobby into you know, a bank balance draining uh, you know, obsession to some degree. Um, but uh, if, if, if I could find a way to you know, make, a, make a comparable living by being interested in disco, I would do that. In a shot. We published a really great book a couple of years ago by Vince Saletti, who's the photography critic for The New Yorker, 
but in the 70s he was uh, the world's greatest writer about disco music. His writing on disco is really profound, and it's very important. And uh, it was published as a weekly column in a trade music journal between 73 and 78, and we republished all of Vince's writings on disco at White Columns, and it was subsequently published as a proper book by a publisher in London. But uh, I think, you know, obviously I'm reading Niall Rogers' biography right now, but I think disco is the, the most important cultural form by a long way. What? Well, it's fun. Um, you know, it's extraordinary musically, I think, you know, its roots in, you know, in gospel, the church, and, uh, you know, the whole legacy of, uh, uh, you know, certain strains of music in the 20th century. But uh, what I like about it most is it, it's, it's a public form of music. It's intended to be heard together with people in social space. So it's, a, it's, a, it's very communal by its nature. So it's very different than, say, listening to a Stephen Mountain's record at home by yourself. Um, it's, 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 it was only ever really intended to unfold in public space. And I think that's part of its magic. It's, uh, but it also unites all kinds of uh, you know, histories, of uh, African-American histories, but also queer histories. And it's very complicated politically and socially. And, uh, but I think also musically, it's, uh, it, it's just remarkably optimistic. And I think it's that sort of uh, combination of optimism and the idea of the social space that it unfolds in. When it, when it happens well. And all these old disco subsequent manifestations too. Um, you know, it's really magical. And I've never found an equivalent for that kind of epiphany in any other cultural form. Uh, it's very different than seeing Joy Division play live when I was young and just really understanding that I was watching something of extraordinary historical significance. And it was just so obvious to everybody in the room. Um, but sort of a great night of the disco is very different thing, but uh, you know, I'm not a religious person, but that's as close as I can imagine a religious epiphany. So I don't know, it's just, uh, it's almost endlessly fascinating for something that's, you know, largely culturally marginalized. And of course, you know, disco was over before, you know, 77, 78, when, you know, Saturday Night Fever and Studio 54, and by then it was done, which is why Vince Letty stopped writing about it in early 78, uh, because it was over. And, uh, I liked its overness, um, but the more you look into it, it's, it's, it's a very special, I think, cultural form. Um, but yeah, that's, that, I don't know, I, don't know I, 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 I DJ occasionally, uh, which I like doing a great deal, um, and that's definitely more fun than running white cards. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. I, I want to thank um, Chris and Brett and others at SCAD who helped make uh, this evening possible. I think if there is even my proposed takeaway from Matthew's talk, you know, find something that you're passionate about and go run with it. Um, I think it's clear that you can actually uh, stay quite curious and quite engaged and quite passionate and still be somewhat surprising to a room of people who think that they came with one set of expectations maybe and walked away with a whole other set of what might be the, the, uh, the important morals of the, uh, the presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, come and join us at the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center uh, when you can. And thanks very much for the evening.